Welcome everyone um, to a slightly different topic here than we expected at our breakfast lecture. Uh, Emily Vale, Executive Director of the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, and I'll be talking about assessing green infrastructure in Kingston's uptown parking lots. Uh, so a good topic for a rainy day like today. So I'll be giving an introduction, some background on the site that I was looking at, talking about a quantitative assessment of green infrastructure for stormwater management and a qualitative assessment of those same practices, along with some conclusions and lessons learned. Um, and I should say that this is research that I did in an academic context, but it was really geared towards practical application. So really understanding for municipalities and for other groups that are working on the ground, how do green infrastructure practices really work um, once they go into a structure like a municipal parking lot? What is the maintenance? How is the performance changing over time? So we hope this will still be useful for you. So uh, you probably know the Hudson River Watershed Alliance. We work to unite and empower communities to protect their local water resources. You know we've been doing a lot of Zoom programs. Uh, thank you again for joining us in those. Prior to my work with the Hudson River Watershed Alliance, I was in graduate school at Cornell University. I got my MS in natural resources, and I was really focused on the uptown parking lots in Kingston as my field work, as my study area. So when I'm talking about green infrastructure, there's a lot of different definitions of this term. What we're talking about here are natural or engineered practices that are designed to manage stormwater. So these practices reduce runoff as it soaks into the soil um, so that when it rains, the water hits that paved surface and runs off into a practice like this bioretention area that is designed to collect that runoff and have it soak right into the soil. And here we're really talking about retrofits. So there, we can think about a distinction between green infrastructure for new development and retrofits that are taking an existing paved area like a parking lot and adding green space and adding improved stormwater management to those areas. So that's what we're talking about here. So in 2012, the Hudson River Estuary Program conducted a survey on barriers to green infrastructure. And one of the interesting findings was that um, municipalities in particular ranked this statement, research hasn't proven benefits yet, substantially higher than other user groups. So while other people felt like the research has proven the benefits, municipalities didn't necessarily have the right information to show the benefits of incorporating these kinds of practices into their uh, public areas. And there have been studies that show that sharing data and lessons learned can help municipalities overcome those barriers. And I want to highlight here the lessons learned, that sometimes it's the stories, it's the narrative, in addition to the data, that can really help make better decisions and understand how to make the most of these practices. So here's a map of the city of Kingston from uh, Laura Heady's Natural Areas and Wildlife uh, in Your Community map. And so the, the parking lots are here on this star in the uptown area. And these were two municipal parking lots on North Front Street. They're right across the street from each other. Kingston does have certain areas within their combined sewer system. These areas are not part of that, so the separate storm sewer system. We've got well-drained sandy loam soil here and a high depth to water, water table about 30 feet. So here's an aerial view of these two parking lots. In 2013, the city of Kingston got a water quality improvement program project grant from the DEC to retrofit these parking lots with green infrastructure practices. Um, the overall project cost uh, 400, almost $500,000. Um, and you can see that prior to construction, uh, the parking lots were not in great shape. There were big puddles. Um, there was lots of cracking in the asphalt. Here are some additional photos of both the north and south lot prior to construction. So the parking lots needed to be redone. And so there was an opportunity to redo them with uh, improved stormwater management practices. So they ended up installing 13 practices over about an acre and a half of asphalt. And they used rain gardens, bioretention areas, dry wells, and pervious paving. And I'll go through what each of those practices are. Essentially, these practices um, disconnected that impervious surface from the stormwater system so that uh, prior to construction, the stormwater runoff uh, would be going uh, into, into the storm sewer system, right into the Esopus Creek, and now this area completely infiltrates. So here's a map for 
if that's helpful. We've got, this is the south lot, the larger lot, um, two bioretention areas right at the entrance, uh, three dry wells here, a small rain garden over here, and a section of pervious pavers. In the north lot, we have another bioretention area here. This is the entrance. So here's North Front Street. We've got a rain garden towards the back, the two dry wells next to each other here, and larger sections of pervious pavers. So the idea of the quantitative assessment is to understand runoff production. How quickly is water level going down in these practices over time? And that's important to understand for the overall function of the practice, and also thinking about implications for flooding, sewage overflows, and stream health. So I was able to measure water level in uh, almost all of the practices using hobo pressure transducers. Um, so those were placed in the two rain gardens, the three bioretention areas, and the five dry wells. I was not able to measure water level in the pervious pavers, but we've got lots of um, observations on those. And there was a rain gauge that was placed in the parking lot to tie rainfall information with water level to understand how each practice responds to rainfall. So how water level goes up and then goes down. And big thanks to the city of Kingston for all their help with, uh, with this work, installing these, these hobos uh, pressure transducers. Um, so these are the rain gardens, both north and south. So you can see that it's a small, depressed area. Um, these were right when they were planted, but they were they were planted, so they have vegetation. And in the rain garden, there was a PVC pipe uh, that had um, cuts in it so that it could measure water level. The hobo was placed at the bottom uh, and about three feet below the, the soil surface. And so when it rains, water enters into the practice, it ponds in that practice, and then eventually goes down. So the, the hobo is measuring the water above, you know, within the soil, and also what's visible on the surface. And it looks a little bit like that after there was some subsidence. The bioretention areas are larger, and they have an underdrain to facilitate faster runoff reduction, so it can really infiltrate faster, which you'll see was, was really not a need here. Um, but they have a gravel sub base. This is a, an overflow riser that you can see this black section here. And in the bioretention areas, the hobos were placed in the, in the riser, um, so hung from a string, sitting at the bottom of that, um, that pipe here. So the idea here is that, again, the water will, will rise when it rains, the hobo can measure that. But in reality, what we saw was that the water would get trapped on top, it would tip into this overflow riser and then collect on the bottom. And you'll see that in some of the charts. Here's what that looked like. And then dry wells are these eight foot diameter concrete cast cylinders um, that look just like a normal storm drain, but actually are, have a gravel sub base and they're designed to have the water that enters into them go right into that native soil below them. Uh, so these are great in dense areas uh, where if you don't have room to have a vegetated practice, you can put in a dry well, assuming you have the, the right soils for it. Um, and that, that takes the water and, and lets it soak right into the soil below. So in the dry wells, the hobo was down at the bottom. They were each about 10 feet deep. So they had a lot of room for water storage and the water would rise. And again, the hobo would measure the water level here. And here's what it looked like. So again, the previous pavers didn't have water level measured, but here are a couple pictures of them being installed. We've got this gravel sub base. We have block pavers here and the pavers themselves are not pervious, but water is able to go in the cracks between them uh, where there's a very fine gravel and soak into the soil there. So between May and November of 2017, I was able to monitor 28 storms with a tipping bucket rain gauge. There it is perched right above the bioretention area here. And a storm was defined as greater than 0.05 inches with more than six hours of a dry period between storms. And there were some storms that happened uh, 
where part of the equipment was down, you know, we missed certain storms. But in terms of the data, we're looking at 28 storms over the course of that, that growing season. There's the tipping bucket rain gauge. <laughs> so the storms that, uh, that I captured in the data are overall pretty small. So the average storm was about half an inch and the duration was about seven hours. So we didn't get any major hurricanes during this time period. Um, and so it's important to note that, that the storms that were recorded are on the smaller side. Speaking of dry weather this season. So I looked at two different metrics for the quantitative analysis. One of them was the maximum depth in feet, which was measured from the hobo. And again, the hobo was buried three feet or you know, 10 feet for the dry well. Um, and so we'll be looking at a couple of graphs of maximum depth. So this was over the course of a storm, what is the highest that the water level got in each practice? The other metric that we're looking at is time to drain. So from that maximum depth, how long did it take for the water to get back down um, and the hobo to record zero as a water level? And I looked at those two metrics in particular because the New York State DEC Stormwater Management Design Manual recommends a maximum ponding of six inches and a maximum time of 48 hours to drain. So we could compare the metrics of these actual practices to the recommendations in the Stormwater Manual to understand how well are these performing in terms of runoff reduction. It's important to note that some storms had no response. Uh, and when I say response, that's a water level that, that shows an increase and especially the bioretention areas. So as I was out there, you can see that water is ponding in these bioretention areas, but because of the placement of the, the hobo pressure transducer in that overflow section, I rarely saw any response at all. So. We're not really focused on the bioretention areas here. It wasn't a, a clear correlation in terms of the storm and the runoff. But what we can assume is that if there is no response, if we don't see a water level increase, but we know I saw water going into the practice, we can assume that the runoff is infiltrating as the same at the same rate as the water is entering, right? So the water's flowing into the system and it's flowing out of the system at the same rate. Okay, so for the rain gardens, um, here's a graph that a box and whisker, whisker graph that shows the maximum depth of water in each of those across those 28 storms. And I've got a dashed line here. This is the soil surface, which it actually looks like it maybe moved a little bit. It should, should be at three feet here. Um, and so it shows that for most storms, water was barely ponding above the surface, right? Um, it was within the soil media. But we had a couple storms that that did exceed that, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So that's about six inches of ponding, and that's about a foot, a little over a foot of ponding. And again, the recommendation from the design manual is to not have the ponding be deeper than six inches. That could be a public health uh, or public safety issue, and it also could uh, harm the practice if it's if it's going deeper than it should be. Looking at the time to drain from the maximum water depth, we see that these practices drained really quickly. So the recommendation is over 40, uh, under 48 hours. And we only had this one storm, which I think this another storm came in. This, this was a little complicated, this clear outlier here, um, but everything else is well under that 48 hour threshold. And in fact, about three quarters of the storms infiltrated in less than 12 hours. So these were, these were draining down really quickly. For the dry wells, I, the hobo was actually buried about a foot below the gravel surface. Um, so again, we see that most of the storms didn't have ponding above that gravel surface. We have a couple of storms, um, but for the most part, these are taking in water almost as quickly as the water is, is entering those dry wells. So we did have one storm that had about two feet of ponding. That was in the fall when there was a lot of leaf litter in the, in the practice. And so the, the rate was much slower to infiltrate. But again, these, these dry wells are about 10 feet deep. They have plenty of storage capacity. And so these are, are doing really well. And that one's about a foot. 
In terms of time to drain, the dry wells infiltrated even faster than the rain gardens. 83% of the storms infiltrated fully in less than one hour. So these are getting water in and draining really quickly. I have one case study storm. So this was uh, in August of 2017. This was the most intense storm that was measured. It rained a little over half an inch, but most of the rain fell in 15 minutes. So you can see this is the rainfall across the day. And we have this really big spike here um, where most of the water fell. And this is important because of um, climate change, right? We're seeing more intense storms, we're seeing um, shorter duration with more rain falling. And so thinking about how are these storms uh, that we might predict in the future going to be uh, for, uh, with green infrastructure practices. So here is the uh, South Rain Garden. This was our most responsive practice. And we've got, um, here is where it rains. It's the blue that's sort of overlaid with this. And we see that water level shot up and then slowly went back down. So this is a good example of how this, this rain garden responded to storms. Uh, we would get some ponding and then it would slowly infiltrate over time. And this is actually that uh, a little over a, a foot of depth of water here. So you can see here, this is a picture I happen to be in the parking lots this day, which uh, makes it for a really great case study here. And um, you can see what that looks like. So this was a very deep, narrow practice uh, that was able to store all that water. This rain garden, again, responded to most of the storms and this was the maximum depth, uh, a little over a foot of ponding. So here is uh, the bioretention area, and we see this. I should note that the scale here is very different. Um, this is about half an inch, and this was the highest that we really saw in this bioretention area again. Again, it's in that, that overflow portion, and so we can see that there isn't so much of storage here, um, but that water is entering that overflow riser, which was basically flush with the, with the ground surface. So this one didn't respond to many storms. It had a maximum depth of one inch. Um, but again, we can assume that the water that's coming into this is draining out of it, and this practice is, is functioning. <laughs> For the dry wells, uh, this was the dry well that uh, received the, the largest proportion of stormwater from the site. Um, again, it was buried about a foot. This is the ground surface. And you can see that when it started raining, it shot up and then shot right back down. So the hobo pressure transducers were set to measure water level every minute. And often in, in streams, when we're looking at water level, you're set to measure every 15 minutes. And these practices were so quick to respond that it really had to be every minute to really capture that peak and to understand this information. So this dry well, um, didn't respond to every storm because most of the time that water level dropped very quickly. Um, and the maximum depth here was about two feet, so about a foot of ponding. So plenty of storage in the dry wells. In terms of the quantitative assessment, no water left the site. Again, the, the storm water was completely infiltrated on site, which is really significant. And there was plenty of storage capacity that was built into the site. These were very small storms, but if we got much bigger storms, there's still plenty of room to store that water and have it drain down. The practices infiltrate runoff really quickly. They're, these are well-drained sandy soils. Each practice is unique. So uh, even the bioretention areas differed, the rain gardens differed, and it really depended on the local conditions. Um, we had large storage capacity here. And performance may change over time. So this is a helpful baseline to see within the first year after these practices were installed, how are they, how are they doing? So another important, uh, some, some take homes here is that the pressure transducers, these hobos were very effective to understand performance. Hobos are pretty low cost and they provided high resolution data every minute. 
And so these could be very useful to monitor runoff reduction in other practices. So that was part of this study as well, is testing this method because there it, it can be very challenging to measure stormwater performance. And this is an option that could be accessible for municipalities or other, other local uh, practitioners that are interested in tracking how these practices are doing over time. So I'm gonna pause here because I see that Eli has joined us. I am so sorry. Uh, well, I should have been with you all and uh, hearing my phone. I had my kid playing with my phone while I was making them breakfast. I thought it started at nine. It is totally my fault. I apologize to everyone who got up early. And thank you so much, Emily, for um, as usual, being able to save the day here. It seems like it might be better for me to let you finish and I will um, come back some other time if you'll have me. Great, we would love that. And we're glad you're okay. Yes. And uh, and so I will continue. Thanks to everyone for, you know, we're, we kind of did a quick left turn into stormwater engineering from community science, but Eli, we'll get, we'll get you back hopefully next month, if not uh, after that. Thank you so much. It's a COVID reality and I'm so sorry. We, I think we all can understand that. Um, and hopefully you all out there are interested in green infrastructure. But again, if you're not, we understand that. Um, and, and we'll get community science on, on at a later date. Okay, so I'm just gonna take a quick breath here and see if there's any questions of the first part that I shared before I jump into the qualitative assessment. Um, I will be forwarding the presentation. We're recording this. I'm happy to make these slides available and we'll be able to share a recording of the talk um, with everyone. Emily, you've said several times that uh, there were some events that water did not pond in the practice and therefore water was just coming in and going out. I, I, isn't it more correct to say that water was coming in and being absorbed into the subsurface as fast as it was entering the practice? Yes. Okay. From the from a water budget perspective, it it's going somewhere. So that no, that's helpful. Thank you. And I'm surprised that the hobo doesn't pick that up at depth, even if it's not, um, you know, even if it, not by some delayed mechanism. Yeah, so the, the depth to water table, that 30 foot depth to water table with those really sandy soils um, makes, I would say, makes this area of Kingston really well suited to green infrastructure, right? Where it uh, can really absorb that runoff very, very well. So it's really encouraging to see all these green infra infrastructure practices that have been installed here because the, the conditions are just so well suited to it. So if the water table is 30 feet down and the hobo is just at the bottom of the practice, the hobo will only be able to capture a temporarily held volume of water before it itself sinks down all the way to 30 feet below to the water table. Yes, exactly, exactly. Got it. Got it. And I see um, there's also a question here. The dry wells seem to be handling the water best. Could you just use the dry well approach? Yes. You could. Um, and this is a great question. And I think uh, this is the last question I'll answer because the next section of the presentation really is a good transition from this. So in this area, like Russell and I were just talking about, the soil conditions are really well suited. And so the, the dry wells really are the workhorses at this site. So most of the stormwater of these parking lots is directed towards the ground wells and they're doing a, or, um, the dry wells and they're doing a great job. And so in other places where the soil conditions are really appropriate, dry wells can be a great option. Again, especially in dense areas where you don't have a lot of room for surface practices, um, dry wells can, can really be useful. And I think even though they're not green, right? They don't have plants. They can be really effective in runoff reduction. The other practices uh, that are green, that are on the surface, have other benefits. And so it's going to be up to you know, the local conditions and what you're looking for to think about, do you want um, a stormwater practice that also includes 
native vegetation for pollinators? Do you want a stormwater practice that also provides shade to the parking lots? And so we can start to look at what some of the co-benefits are um, and think about which practice is most appropriate for the site. Um, but I think you know, one of these findings was that dry wells can be really useful. They've been used in different locations for a long time. They're not necessarily an innovative practice, but they are working. So um, that was a really interesting take home. Okay. Great. Um, so I'm going to move on to the next part and we'll have more time for questions at the end. So um, I'm moving on now to the qualitative assessment, looking at not just the practice itself, but the site scale. So zooming out to a, a broader perspective. And the qualitative assessment was done with visual observations to provide context for the data. We know that these are dynamic practices, they'll change over time, and there are a lot of important lessons learned here that can improve both design and management. So thinking about how the, these practices are designed at the onset and then how they're managed and changing over time. So I'm going to go through a couple of different issues that uh, were identified. I was in these parking lots at least every two weeks, uh, downloading data from the hobos. Um, but these are also uh, popular parking lots that I was in very frequently. Um, and so I have lots of photos and, and very frequent visual observations. So one of the first problems that arose, uh, going back to, to the dry wells, is that the grading was off. And so uh, we can see here that the water is flowing out towards the street and it's missing the dry well. So a practice can only work as well as, you know, if water is coming into it. And so uh, here the city of Kingston went back and pulled up some of that asphalt and created this um, almost like a little drainage basin around that dry well. And after that, it worked really well. But that was not planned for. Um, that was because the installation didn't go quite right, uh, and they had to come back and fix that. So it represents an additional cost. The pervious pavers have some potential for clogging. We can see here, um, this is the, the cracks in between where the water is supposed to go down. And this reflection shows that water is already ponding in this area. Um, within a month of it being installed. And there was plenty of vegetation, weeds growing up through the cracks, uh, cigarette butts are just about the right width to get lodged in there. Um, and so these pervious pavers in particular have the potential for clogging and that needs to be considered as part of the maintenance, uh, vacuuming those out and making sure the water can get in again so that the practice can function. The dry wells also have potential for clogging. Uh, there was this one little area um, that had no vegetation that seemed to be pretty consistently the parking spot of a pickup truck. I have a nice photo montage of all the pickup trucks uh, that I saw parked there, many different ones. Um, but you can see that it's, it's mobilizing some of this soil, which is going right into this dry well. And then there were also trees around the site that had leaves. Um, all of that would go into these dry wells. And you can see um, this photo from 2018, we've got a new layer of soil here on top of the gravel where there's plants that are actually growing. Um, so that's showing that the gravel that's there is getting filled in by finer sediment. And over time, these dry wells may not infiltrate quite so quickly. Um, and that's okay, they infiltrate extremely quickly right now, but it is something to think about. It's harder to maintain a practice that's 10 foot below the surface than a practice that's at ground level. So if you're thinking about vacuuming out pervious pavers, versus a dry well, right? The maintenance is gonna be a little bit different. And that's another trade-off to think about. So parking lots are for cars to park, right? And one of the challenges at the beginning of this was that many cars were driving through the bioretention areas. So you can see some tire tracks here and also some tire tracks here. And this was people were driving in from the street People were driving out from the parking lot. It was a mess. And uh, this was the entrance of the parking lot and that the parking lot was reconfigured. So people were on autopilot. Um, and so the city had to install a fence here. They had to do that with all of the practices that were right along the road. And you can see they put some reflective tape on there so people could um, 
see it at night. So that helped a lot, but again, it was not an initial part of the design. It was something that probably should have been included in the beginning uh, to make sure that people weren't driving through these. For pedestrians, um, again, the configuration of these bioretention areas right along the road blocked the path of pedestrians. So if you park your car over here, <laughs> you, you're walking over here, you can see all these footprints. This is technically a part of the stormwater practice. And in the designs, that's part of the storage. And so people were walking through here, you can see prior to having the, the permanent fences, they had put up some uh, fencing to deter um, vehicles, but it did not deter pedestrians, uh, including myself, I'll admit, uh, walking through here because it was the closest way to get from the parking lot to the businesses that are in the uptown neighborhood. And so over time, this became uh, really the way that people walked. You can see that when they installed the fences, they left space for pedestrians here, um, still walking through the stormwater practice. Uh, and eventually they put in some, um, some material as a walking path. You can see with this downspout, it washed into the practice and was eventually replaced by these pervious pavers. And this downspout was redirected um, to go towards a dry well that was in the parking lot. So again, we see over time, there's a need to design for pedestrians. And when pedestrians aren't included in the design, they're gonna figure a way out, right? Um, these are pervious pavers. This is still infiltrating, but it also took away a big part of the, the storage of the stormwater practice. So that's really something to think about. In terms of vegetation, only one of the uh, practices was mulched and that really helped keep weed growth down, really helped with maintenance of the vegetation over time. Uh, the other practices had lots of weed growth. Um, and you can see that, the, you know, here the easiest way to maintain that is to mow. And much of the native vegetation that was planted in these was eventually mowed down. And so we just have a couple of service berry bushes that are remaining here. Um, so thinking about the, the maintenance needs, how to have um, vegetation in your practices, we know that native vegetation is important for pollinators, for habitat for shading, um, but we need to make sure that the whoever's doing the maintenance, in this case, the DPW, it's easy enough for them to properly maintain this. And I think having some of that mulch would have been really helpful. We saw erosion in the practices where some of the sides were, were pretty steep. I'm not gonna dwell on that. Um, knocking off some of the bricks and resulting in, in this case, in this uh, rain garden, in some cracking along the parking lot. Um, this again is a that very deep rain garden. And so that's also something to be mindful of that, um, you know, once these practices go in, the water can, you know, if there is erosion or subsidence uh, lead to cracking like this. Um, so something to be aware of. I'm going to skip that in the interest of time and jump to winter maintenance. Um, so these parking lots um, are plowed in the winter. They are the emergency parking lots. So after uh, a big storm, the, uh, these are the last to be plowed. And so what we end up with is a lot of road salt that are that is used to de-ice these. So on pervious pavers, um, there tends to be better uh, you tend to need to use re less road salt because the connectivity with the ground soil means that the the water is more the ice is more likely to melt over those areas um, but nonetheless there was buildup of ice and a lot of road salt was used in these areas especially because this water connects directly with groundwater it's important to consider the de-icing material here we couldn't use sediment we couldn't use um really anything other than road salt because it would clog up the practices. But with using road salt, we have an increased amount of salt that's going into the groundwater system that could eventually affect uh, surface water. So that's something to be thinking about. The other thing with winter maintenance is that, you know, these bioretention areas that are all, all around the perimeter seem like the perfect place to plow snow. They're just empty green space. 
but the force of the snow plow and the weight of the snow actually did considerable damage to the woody vegetation that's here. And so that's another thing to think about. If these areas are really important for snow storage, which that seems like a, a they could multitask in that way for that season, um, then there should be vegetation planted there that can withstand the weight and the force of the snow plowing. If it's more important to have trees and shrubs, then the snow should be moved elsewhere to make sure that they aren't um, damaged. So some take homes here, it's really important to design for urban areas that parking lots are not just for cars, although they should be safe for drivers. Um, they're also for pedestrians and making sure there's places for people to move about um, in ways that make sense. It's important to have proper insulation. We saw some issues with grading and appropriate maintenance over time to make sure that the practices are still really working well. So that relates to the vegetation, preventing clogging and so on. And overall, I think the aesthetics of, the, of these could really stand to be improved. Um, I'll say that since, since I worked on this practice, on this project, these practices have been adopted by the Kingston YMCA Farm Project and their BARC program, which is beautifying and restoring Kingston. And so Kingston youth have worked hard to replant these, to use native vegetation. They've planted flowers. They've done some signage. Um, cleanups to make sure that these practices look much better. Um, and we are actually working with the city of Kingston now to share these lessons learned from their perspectives with the, the vegetation and the maintenance and my perspectives with this research um, to have future parking lots with green infrastructure installed in Kingston that take these lessons learned into account. So I think there's a lot to be said for visual observations. In a lot of ways, it told a much more detailed story than just the data alone. It helped identify some of the causes of issues that showed up in the data. And long-term, a lot of these things um, could really impact performance. Um, again, here's another uh, snow, snow plow photo where we see that the melting snow is almost overflowing this practice. So another consideration there. So again, green infrastructure co-benefits are really important. We talk about how green infrastructure can contribute to, to cooling, wildlife, um, water quality, water quantity, um, but we can't necessarily expect all of the co-benefits all of the time, especially if they're not explicitly designed into the project. And what I found were some conflicting uses of the space. And we have to think about what are the highest priorities and what are the trade-offs for making these different design decisions. So for, here's a schematic. <laughs> this is uh, an aerial shot of, uh, I took this from the map of the plan. So here's the road, here's the sidewalk. We've got the building here and the bioretention area. This is the parking lot. Hopefully everyone's with me here. And this looks like empty green space, right? It looks like empty green space that can be used for snow plowing and, and any number of other things. When in reality, we have all of these different uh, demands on this space. So we have vehicles trying to get through so we put the fence up we've got pedestrians trying to get through so we, we, they put the walkway in we've got snow plow needing to use this as a storage space and there was also a parking meter that was installed here so taking away even more of the storage potential um, because this is a public parking lot that has a parking meter right and so if we think about all of the the ways that we need to use this space and have them really up front I think we can have better stormwater designs that benefit people and the parking lot and the water quality in a better way. So um, again, most of the parking lot was treated by the hardscape green infrastructure. Most of it was treated by the pervious pavement and the dry wells that don't have vegetation, that don't necessarily have um, some of that green space benefits. Um, and they may have more demanding maintenance requirements. So there's these trade-offs that we really need to consider. So uh, I've got some recommendations uh, for future parking lots, like making sure that mulch is used in the vegetated practices to reduce weeds and to hold moisture, 
uh, using dense or native vegetation to handle the weight of snow, making sure that pervious pavement is vacuumed and maintained, adding trash cans to reduce litter seems pretty straightforward, but a lot of the litter, uh, because there were, no park, there, there were no trash cans there, the litter was ending up in these practices. Uh, training for maintenance staff and really making sure that the maintenance staff are articulating their needs so that the designs can reflect what is going to work best for maintenance. Um, and then also this opportunity for educational signs. Maintenance should be part of the design. Again, we should consider the size of the drainage areas for pervious pavers in particular. Um, some more technical things like perhaps including a four bay planning for pedestrians, signs for wayfinding, especially if there's new exits and entrances, and making sure the site has a planting plan that really is appropriate. So post-construction assessment is really important. I think this was a really unique opportunity to take a really, really close look uh, at these specific types of practices. Frequently, fun funding for green infrastructure only includes design and or construction and doesn't include this sort of post-construction assessment. And so my hope is that this information can be really useful to think about how you might be thinking about your own green infrastructure practices in your community um, or, or as practitioners. So again, so important to consider priorities, trade-offs, and co-benefits early in the process to inform successful design, installation, and maintenance. And there's a need for adaptive maintenance as well, to see how something is going and being flexible to accommodate what, what new needs might arise. These are dynamic practices, and we're still learning a lot about them. And to that end, it is very important to share green infrastructure stories, not only data, uh, to make sure that we understand what's working well and what could really use improvement. And so here I'll just say that these practices worked extremely well for runoff reduction, right? This is not to, to say that these were unsuccessful projects. Um, they were extremely successful in that mission, um, but it was, we were able to highlight all of these other important lessons learned for design and maintenance to be moving forward. Uh, so a big thank you uh, to New York State Water Resources Institute at Cornell and the Soil and Water Lab, Hudson River Estuary Program, and all the partners that helped put this research together. It was a pretty substantial project. Um, and with that, I will take questions. Yeah, why don't you let me pitch the questions, Emily? We'll just switch our normal roles. Perfect. Um, so let me start with one that um, came in from Annie Osborne. How are hydrocarbons uh, managed between these various practices? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we know that, that parking lot, lot runoff has pollutants. Um, there's heavy metals coming off of cars, there's sediment, there's um, nutrients in the runoff, and certainly hydrocarbons as well, leaky cars. Um, and so these practices are not explicitly designed to remove, but as the, as the stormwater is filtering through the soil, many of those um, are removed. By the, by the filtration mechanism. So um, I'm not sure exactly what the fate of hydrocarbons would be. Um, in some of my previous research, I looked at heavy metals actually, and how heavy metals can bind to uh, particles in the soil and be removed from the water. But there also could be buildup of heavy metals in the soil or even in the plant vegetation. And so that's another part of maintenance over time is there that there might be a need to replace the soil media or to replace the vegetation. Um, which, which suggests, I think, that the bioretention slash rain garden concept does far more than the dry well approach. Yeah, and it depends how you know, I, I did my undergraduate research on uh, green infrastructure at, at Vassar College and was looking at some parking lots there for, for water quality. And I found that, you know, the student parking lot had higher heavy metal because the cars were older. <laughs> and so it even depends on like who's parking in the parking lot um, to look at some of the details on the, the water quality in the in these parking lots. Um, in the case of Kingston, you know, we had some areas that had heavy leaf litter and others that didn't. So it's really important to take a look at the contributing area to each practice to think about how, um, you know, buildup of pollution or even organic material like leaves might be impacting over time. Great. 
question from Simon Gruber about uh, maintaining the per pervious pavement and back trucks. Uh, yep, they should be they should be vacuumed out, um, and they have not been. And I'm not sure, you know, I can't speak to, to why they haven't been. Um, but, you know, I think that there are, there's a certain equipment that can be used for va vacuuming those out. Uh, I, I believe it's also used for vacuuming out you know, storm drains for MS4 type maintenance. Um, I don't know if there's a particular question about that. It was mostly, uh, there, there, it, it's controversial, you know, that not every municipality has access to a vac truck. Um, is it necessary? Are we, particularly for a rain garden, I guess the answer is you don't do that. Whereas for porous pavement, uh, the conventional thinking is that you should. And as you pointed out for a dry well, the dry well will cease to function if you let it clog down at depth. Um, yeah, so that's right. Kind of maintenance costs associated with each one. Right, and and with the dry well, you know, that's a confined space in a certain way, you know, so, so it really is a question of long-term maintenance. Which leads us to a question from Marianne Brown, which asks kind of globally, can you reduce costs with just using dry wells? And my guess is your answer is going to say long-term, short-term answers that question differently. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that dry wells are a great option. You know, they weren't They've been around for a while. They weren't really on my radar as a green infrastructure tool. There are other types of practices um, that are similar to a dry well, like an infiltration chamber, right, that is below a paved area that takes advantage of storage underneath impervious surface. And so I think, you know, in the right setting, a dry well can work really well. Um, but we should really think about the overall goals, the long-term, short-term costs, and the setting as well. If you have space to do something like a rain garden or a bioretention area, um, that should be considered. Bill Fetter has a question about the hobo data loggers, uh, whether they're easy to use. Uh, I'm gonna expand on that, you know, price point, accessibility. What is your impression of this, this tool? Yeah. Uh, I really like working with hobos. Um, I know a lot of groups have used them to measure water level in the streams, in uh, lakes and ponds. They are very user friendly. Um, they're they're pretty inexpensive. Um, I think they're a couple hundred dollars each, and they have a particular software. So um, you go out and download the data and put it right on your computer, and the software is able to convert that. So um, they are pressure transducers. So they are measuring pressure and it, the program uh, actually converts the pressure to water depth. Uh, I had an additional hobo transducer on site to measure air pressure and then it corrects, you know, it takes the air pressure out and it leaves the water pressure. Um, so they are really handy to use. There are other types of um, pressure transducers that you can use, but part of the reason that I used them in my study was it seems like a very accessible tool for volunteer groups, municipalities, you know, and others that aren't having a huge, you know, monitoring budget uh, to think about how they can be used. Yeah, Hobo is a nice brand, and at least last I t time I looked, their, their same data logging technology is applied to temperature sensors or relative humidity sensors. So if you're doing indoor air quality studies, people are also using Hobo data loggers because they just equip a different sensor to them. Uh, so they've they've been around. They stood the test of time. They're a nice brand. Um, Annie Osborne has a question about how long the parking lot was under construction. Yeah, about a month. So they phased the construction. Um, so the the south lot was done first um, over the course of I believe it was like August into September, and then the north parking lot was done September into October. Very nice. Well, I have a question which relates to groundwater quality. Um, the early, uh, an earlier version of the New York State Stormwater Guide discouraged infiltrat infiltration practices under roads and parking lots because they did not want to be party to injecting salt into the ground. Mm. Um, and it clearly the literature related to porous pavement and these kind of practices leads one away from sanding uh, because you're going to clog your practice or fill it and it needs to be cleared later. 
and towards salt. Um, and everything that you've shared with us today is basically an opportunity to put salt in the ground under this parking lot. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you have thoughts about that. Yeah, so, you know, again, I think this parking lot is is interesting because it is the emergency parking lot. Um, so in Kingston, when it snows more than four inches, emergency parking goes into effect and you are only allowed to park on certain sides of the street. Most people are supposed to move their cars off the street and into one of these parking lots. And I mention this because I think this is where policy has something to do with this too. So those parking lots are the last ones to be plowed because uh, they are they serve as emergency parking and they need to plow the streets first. So we end up with a higher buildup of ice and snow in those parking lots than the average parking lot, which might get plowed faster. And so I think that's something to think about too, is how are emergency parking lots um, treated uh, if this buildup is is different, um, people are even shoveling their cars off after they've been plowed. You know, it's just a different dynamic, and that's where I think that some of these um, municipal policies are part of the design and maintenance question. They they should be considered. Um, I think that less salt could probably be used on these parking lots because of that connection, particularly over the pervious sections because of that um, air connection and, and the higher temperature in the winter. Um, but that's something to really take a closer look at is the contribution of green infrastructure practices to road salt and groundwater. Yeah, I've been I've had mixed feelings about all these practices. Um, it's also true that groundwater under a city uh, is not typically used for potable purposes. And so the Brownfields program, for example, allows uh, more generous cleanup standards in such settings. And maybe a, a parking lot in an urban area could be put into that same category. But um, it, it's, it's a topic worth exploring. So thank you for the, those thoughts. Yeah, and I, I'd like to just answer one of Simon's other questions because I just saw it and I want to clarify this. So Simon asked about having um, the drainage area for pervious pavement practices and having most of the parking lot be traditional asphalt with a smaller portion of it be pervious paving and the rest of the parking lot graded to drain towards that pervious area. So that is exactly how these were designed. And I uh, don't know that I would recommend that. Um, that's something that I, I sped through in the interest of time here. Um, but basically what has happened is that the pervious pavement portions, because their, their drainage area is so large, they clogged very quickly. And so they clogged with leaf litter and they clogged with trash and cigarette butts. And so I think that um, had that drainage been directed towards a dry well or a bioretention area, you know, they could have withstood that more. But with such a large drainage area, the pervious, pa pervious pavers got clogged extremely quickly, and that leads to higher maintenance costs. So I, I think it's probably better to have more of the drainage area go towards more easily maintained projects um, or things like the, the vegetative practices like the bioretention or the rain garden because they can take that particularly the fine sediment and the leaf litter incorporate that a little bit better. That's a really good observation Emily. Um, we, we're about to close but this is reminding me of a slide where you had a certain percentage of area assigned to bioretention and certain area assigned to rain garden but when I do a quick google those are the same. Rain gardens are bioretention areas. Um, how are you distinguishing them from each other? Sure, so the bioretention has an underdrain and that's really the biggest difference. So the, the bioretention areas tend to be more heavily engineered. They had that gravel subbase with that perforated pipe um, as a, the, uh, to, to facilitate more drainage with that overflow riser. And the rain gardens are just the soil. They don't have um, that overflow, they don't have um, that perforated pipe at the bottom. Got it. Um, thank you very much, Emily. Thanks for landing us on our feet today with a great presentation. For having me. <laughs> yeah, and uh, thank you. Thank many of you. There are 30 people still on the call. So this is a, a really nice turnout for a Watershed Alliance breakfast. Um,
uh, speaker uh, session. So uh, thank you very much. And I, I think those of you who were here when Eli popped his head in suggested he could be our December speaker. So um, we look forward to seeing you next month and um, uh, best wishes for Thanksgiving. And uh, we'll see you in a few weeks.